Well, hello, everybody. Welcome. Westminster Confession of Faith, Chapter 4 of Creation. Let's get started. Here we go. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from darkness. He called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning on the first day. Then after this, God said, let us make man in our own image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and there was evening and And there was morning on the sixth day. Pray with me, please. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this opportunity to study again virtually on this video. We pray, Father, that you'll encourage our hearts and strengthen us as we dive deeper into your word, what it teaches, the system of theology, how we can understand and grow in our relationship with you and our understanding of you. You've revealed yourself to us. You've made yourself known to us. And Father, you've created us, and you want us to live in a relationship with you. And we give you praise for that today, and we ask that you will be with us, guide us, direct us, encourage us as we study together what it means to say we believe that you created the heavens and the earth in the very beginning, and what that means for us. We thank you for your mercy, and we thank you for your grace. We thank you for Jesus, in whom we pray. Amen. Well, welcome to, I believe it's the fifth video of our Westminster Confession of Faith video series this summer. First was an intro, and then we've been through three chapters of the Westminster Confession of Faith, the chapter of Scripture, of God, and of the Holy Trinity, and last week of God's eternal decree. Today we turn our attention to of creation, of creation. And so uh, to get us started, before I jump into that, though, I need to remind you that in the video show notes or in the video description below. If you're watching on YouTube or if you're on our church app, it'll be in that video description as well or on Sermon Audio. Uh, It is there. You can find a link to the confession itself, but also to the slides that I will be using today for this presentation as we discuss what it means to say God created the heavens and the earth. As we get started with reference to last week, we talked about God's eternal decree, the fact that God has an eternal purpose and an eternal plan for all things. As with reference to that, last week to that understanding of God's eternal decree, uh, I want to to tie this week and next week to that kind of the progression of the thought of the Westminster Divines as they developed the Westminster Confession of Faith. And I think the best way to do that is by looking at Westminster Shorter Catechism I forget what exact question this is. I think it's question number eight. Uh, Don't hold me to that, but I think it's question number eight. And this is question number eight. How does God execute his decrees? How does God execute his decrees, right? So God has a decree. We looked at that last week. How all things are going to go. How does God execute that? The answer is God execute his decrees in the works of creation and providence. God executes his decrees in the works of creation and providence and providence. And so the way God carries out his plan is first by creation, second by providence. Uh, Let's think about this for a second. At our church, we are in the process of preparing to transform a green space, which is to the left of our office where uh, an old funeral home used to be. 
We're in the process of transforming that green space into a park that's going to be nice that we can use as a congregation, an outdoor meeting space, but a multi-purpose space, but also something our community can use as well to beautify our, our property, to beautify our city, but also give us more accessible space and more usable space at, uh, on our facilities. And so we're in the process. Well, we hired a landscape architect. The landscape architect comes back with a conceptual design. Our committee uh, has approved the conceptual design. Our deacons approved the conceptual design. Our session com- approved the conceptual design. Now the landscape architect has put together a planting plan, and now the uh, and, and and that's been approved. And so now he is coming back with a cost estimate of the conceptual design. So we have at this point, and we will within the next week or two, have an actual conceptual design plan that we can then begin to implement and put into place and put into action. Well, how do you do that? Well, the first step of implementing the plan, right? You got to have the plan. The first step of implementing the plan is the installation. Right, so there'll be all the work that's necessary, the moving of the dirt, but there'll be the creating of the actual green space design and be a planting and those kind of things. Once that process and that step is completed, right, then we will begin the process of maintenance. So you got the installation phase, the quote creating phase, and we may do that in multiple phases, but you got creating phase, and once that's done and finished then we will have the maintenance part. Now, this illustration breaks down, admittedly, in some ways when we think about God and his creative genius and God's work in the world. But just as a, at a broad level, I think it actually helps us understand. God has a plan for all things. How does he begin to implement that plan? Well, first of all, through the creating of all things, right? Through creation itself. Then, once that is completed, and we'll talk about that in a moment, once that is completed... Then there is the process of maintenance, of preservation, of uh, keeping it going uh, long term. And that's the work of God's providence. God's providence is his most holy, wise, and just preserving and governing all his creatures and their actions. And so God has put in place natural laws. He's also working supernaturally at times in order to ensure that his people are preserved, his creatures are governed, and his plan is enacted. So think about it that way. God's decree starts with creation, continues on with providence. Just like our plan put in place, right, with the phase of of building and installation, and then it will be maintained and kept up as it continues to grow and flourish. So we think about today, we're beginning to see the implementation of God's decree, God's plan. And so it would make sense, if you think in, in a system of thought, chronologically, Scripture is the foundation, then the tree trunk, then the part where all the limbs are starting to come off, and some of those main limbs coming off that trunk uh, from the decree are creation and providence. And so let's dive into this this morning. There are two primary approaches that we can use to discuss creation, and I see them in various capacities and various uh, uh, levels of use in, um, in, in discussions of creation. The first is more confrontational or negative, and I don't mean negative in the sense of it's down in the dumps or it's pessimistic. It's more negative in the sense of it, it's going to say, this is uh, what you believe, this is n- that's not true, this is true. So it's, it's, it's looking at it from a, more of a not point of view. And so we could use it confrontationally and we could say, you know, we could use the confessions teaching on, uh, on creation, which is a c- compilation of what the Bible teaches on creation, summary statement. We could use it to confront and to challenge the modern assumptions of the beginning of life and the modern assumptions of life itself. And so you see people do this. There's nothing wrong with this at all. In fact, sometimes it's very necessary. I I tend to want us to more function or focus, excuse me, on the second approach, and that's informational. My goal for us in this study is to learn and focus on the confessions teaching about creation in order to inform us of how God is and what that means for us. That's my goal throughout the entire study of the confession. Help us understand what the Bible teaches us regarding how God works in creation and how, what that means for us. Because I think we need to be s- firm on what we believe and who we are and what the Bible teaches as Christians 
then as we begin to interact with those who would have difference of opinions, we can begin to have informed discussions with them. Confrontational sometimes just becomes emotional. And quite frankly, a lot of the modern objections to creationism and a lot of the modern understandings of life and human life and the way we interact, if I could just be honest, in my opinion, quite frankly, are so irrational. They don't deserve a response. And so um, I think we would waste a lot of our time. So I, I want us to take some time to really understand what the confession teaches about how God works in creation, what that means for us. So the big questions of creation is where we're going to start. The Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter number four on creation or of creation has two sections. The first section has to do with the big questions of creation itself. How did it get here? The second section has to do with man, with Adam and Eve, with our four first parents. So let's start with section number one, and we'll title this part of our study, The Big Questions. This is what section number one says. It's on your screen, but again, you can pull this up in the video description below. There is a link. It pleased God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost for the manifestation of the glory of His eternal power, wisdom, and goodness, in the beginning to create or make of nothing the world and all things therein, whether visible or invisible, in the space of six days, and all very good. And all very good. So that's the first section of chapter 4. Now, ask some big questions. The big questions that we want to ask about creation and about how we got here, the Bible answers for us, big questions that the confession answers are simply who, why, when, what, how long, and what kind of quality is it? Okay, think about that. So if you're a journalist or something, you're asking the who, what, when, where, why, right, and how. Those are the six big questions. So if we got those six questions, right, so who, why, when, what, how long, and what kind of quality, six big questions that we're trying to ask. First of all, who, right, the who of creation is simple, it's God. The Bible is clear, Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, the darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. God in the beginning was, nothing else was, only God. He created, God was the active agent, God is the active agent of creation. And so God created, so the who of creation is God. The why of creation, the divines clearly state there, for the manifestation of the glory of his eternal power, wisdom, and goodness. The public display of his glory, the public display of his power, the public display of his wisdom, and the public display of his goodness. So God wants to show, right, his glory. Now, why does, does God have to do that? No. He chooses to do that. He wants to do that. He wants to create a world that demonstrates His glory, that radiates His majesty, that shows off His power, it shows off His wisdom, that shows off His goodness. He just simply wants to have a world. And we could even go so far as to say that He wants to have a world that demonstrates His love, though this is not specifically stated in the Confession it is a biblical concept that God wants to demonstrate his love. He wants to display his love. He wants a world that he can love because God is so full of love that the, his love is overflowing and he wants to share that love with his created world, with his created beings. And so he creates in order to display his glory, power, wisdom, and goodness. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 1, that the power of God, the eternal nature of God, the wisdom of God, the goodness of God is on display in the creation itself. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. And so we see that throughout the testimony of the Bible. So the who is God, the why of creation is to display the glory of God. That's why everything exists. It's why you exist, why I exist, why everything we see exists. The when of creation, well that's simple, in the beginning. In the beginning, <laughs> before anything was. It's not a time period. It's not a number of years. We're not going to trace back young earth, old earth, all that stuff. We can have those conversations, but ultimately, for our purposes, it just it suffices to say, in the beginning. 
When did God do it? In the very beginning. The Bible says confident with that prepositional phrase. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The what of creation? Everything that there is. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I read verse 1 through verse uh, 5 as we get started uh, this, in this lesson. But if we were to go verses 6 of Genesis all the way down through verse 25, and then I read 26 and 27, uh, if we were to pick it back up at 28 and go all the way down through the end of chapter 1, we would see that God created everything. Everything, all that there is. From what? Absolutely nothing. So there was nothing. Verse 3 says of Genesis chapter 1, uh, excuse me, verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1 says, The earth was without form and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the heavens. There was absolutely nothing. Nothing existed at all. God out of nothing made something. That's the creative power of God. God is all that there is that exists. He creates the world out of nothing. He fashions the world out of nothing. That is a fundamental belief of Christianity. Has been and will always be a fundamental belief of Christian uh, creationism. Of creationism with a Christian slant. If we want to describe it that way. So how long did it take God? This is a big question in our world. How long did it take God to create? Well, the Bible says six days. Now, I'm not going to get into details about whether or not this is six literal 24-hour days or six periods. Some of us would have different discussions about that. You need to understand that there's a lot of discussions about trying to, trying to take um, the age of uh, that science says the earth is and, 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 and make it fit with the testimony of the Bible, this, that, and the other. Listen, the divines... When they were writing this, knew nothing of that debate. That's a 19th century onward debate. Um, the Westminster Divines never questioned whether God could do this in six days. It was six literal 24-hour days when they wrote the Westminster Confession of Faith. I, I don't choose to have that argument because of two reasons. Number one, I think the Bible focuses on the who and the why of creation more so than the how long and the how he did it question of creation. In other words, the Bible says six days. Are those 24-hour days or not? That's a debate that many faithful Christians have had over the years. But that's not the emphasis. We can get lost in that conversation. The emphasis of the creative nar creation narrative is simple. God did it. God did it out of nothing. God created all that there is, and he did it for the purpose of his glory, to demonstrate his power, his wisdom, and his goodness. Okay, so that's really what the Bible's emphasis is. And so we get lost in these secondary, third-level conversations when we miss the main primary points. The main primary points is God did it out of nothing in a span of time for the purpose of glorifying himself and demonstrating his power, his wisdom, and his goodness. The other reason I choose not to get into that is I, I think that... Uh, God could have done it in six 24-hour days if he chose to create it with age. God could have done it in six seconds. God could have done it in six milliseconds. God could have done it in 6,000 years. It's God's prerogative to do it however amount of time he wants to do it. And I'm going to leave that with him. Now, that may sound simple, but I think that's really what we've got to do. That's the essence of faith. Do I just simply trust it? You know what? God did it, and he could do it in six 24-hour days? Absolutely. Could God do it in six seconds? Yes. Could God do it in 6,000 years? Yes. Could God do it at any length of time that he wanted to? Absolutely. Because why? He's God. And I'm going to let him be God. So God did it in six days. We're just going to leave it at that. The divines meant six 24-hour days. That's historically what the church has believed. I'm going to hold to the historic teachings. We can have that debate at a different time. What's the quality? The quality, well, it was all very good. So we're told that God saw, verse, 20, verse 31, Genesis chapter 1, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning on the sixth day. God said it was all very good. Now the beginning of chapter 2 is God rests on the seventh day. God doesn't rest like you and I need to rest because he's tired from his work. You and I need rest and re refreshment and restoration on the seventh day uh, so that we can be ready to go to work for six more days. Uh, that's the purpose of the rest on the Sabbath day command. It was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. That's why Christian church is so important. It's a time of restoration. It's a time of relaxation. It's a time of 
taking a breath because we need it. God didn't need it, right? God did it because it was done. His work was done. You know, you rest either when you need it or when you're finished with your task. God's task was finished in six days. It was very good. It couldn't be improved upon. And so God sat down and said, you know what? I'm going to take a rest on the seventh day. He completed the work. Right? We have to learn to complete our work and say, you know what? You're in control, God. We're going to rest as well. So that's another conversation for another time. But the work was completed and it was very, very good. God was pleased with all that he had created. Now... That was the first section, the big questions. Who, why, when, what, how long, and what is the quality? The second section of the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 4 of creation, has to do with the creation of Adam and Eve, creation with, of man and woman. And so this is what it says. And again, this is on your, if you want to pull that up, you can have it before you. After God had made all other creatures, he created man, male and female, with reasonable and immoral, excuse me, reasonable and immortal souls endued with knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness after his own image, having the law of God written in their hearts and power to fulfill it, and yet under a possibility of transgressing, being left to the liberty of their own will, which was subject unto change. Besides this law written in their hearts, they received a command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which while they kept were happy in their communion with God and had dominion over the creatures. So now the confession goes from the general broad, God created everything that was very good, to a very narrow understanding of God creating man, male, and female. Now there's nine points that we're going to pull out of this, nine truths. We're going to work our way through briefly, don't fret. We're going to work our way through briefly nine truths that we're going to pull out of this that have impact for us and help us inform us as to the creation of man and what still is uh, applicable to us today. And then once we're finished with that, we're going to try to apply it in four different ways. So go with me here. Section number two, nine truths. First of all, we see from section number two, which pulls its understanding straight out of the biblical narrative, Men and women are the crowning achievement of God's creation. It says here, at the very beginning of the second section, after God had made all other creatures, he created man, male and female. Right? So after God had created everything else, he creates man. He prepares the world, as it were, for men. The garden was prepared for Adam and Eve. So after God had created everything... All the land animals, all the waters, uh, all the waters, all the fish in the waters, all the birds in the air, etc. Then he creates man, male and female. And so men and women are the crowning achievement of God's creation. Uh, we are created um, as those with whom God can have a relationship. We are the objects, the primary objects of his love. We are created to live in, the, uh, in relationship with him, communion with him, and have exercise his dominion over the world in which we live. And so men and women are, crea are the crowning achievement of God's creation. There, you and I are not like any other creation. We are different. We are the crowning achievement. The second thing that we're told in the Bible, and the confession brings to the foreground, is that men and women are created male and female. This is what he says here. Uh, verse 26, after God says, let us create man in our own image, in our own likeness. Verse 27 of Genesis chapter 1. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created them male and female. God created them male and female. Simply put, God created two genders. He created male, he created female. We were created for a divine purpose, male and female. That purpose is laid out in chapter 2 for procreation, for helpmate, so the two can become one, uh, uniquely and wonderfully created with specific purpose ways about us, the way we think, the way we act, the way we interact. We are created in all those different aspects to be complements of one another, male and female. And so God created man, male and female. That's the clear teaching of the text. Number three, men and women have rational and immortal souls. So verse 26 of Genesis chapter 1 says, God says, let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea 
and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So if the crowning achievement, male and female, made in the image of God, in the likeness of God, that means we are created to have rational capacities that no other animal has. So we have... Um, dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over all the earth. In order to have dominion, you've got to have some rational capacity, right? To rationalize, to think, to uh, think on your own, right? We, we know in our world that there's a lot of research going on how um, chimps uh, or apes of different kinds can be taught how to mimic, can learn. Well, they can learn. There's a difference between being able to learn something and being able to create and think and um, have an, an imagination the way you and I do, right? There's a big difference. And so God created us with that rational capacity, reasonable is the language of the confession, reasonable capacity that no other animal had, no other creature had. Because we're created in his image, but we're also created with immortal souls. Not eternal souls, immortal souls. Every one of us has a soul. The soul is the union of body and spirit and the breath of God. We're told God breathed, Genesis chapter 2, God breathed life. When God breathed life into Adam and then uh, pulled from the life of Adam and made Eve, when God breathed that life, he gave the soul to Adam, and so that was the beginning. And every one of us has a beginning, right? But we do not have an end. Our souls do not have an end, right? We, we know that even those who are with the Lord and those who are not with the Lord will continue on into eternity. The question is, where will you spend your next life? Where will you spend your eternity? With the Lord or not with the Lord? That's basic Christian teaching. It's basic biblical teaching. And so... We know that the soul does not die, the soul goes to be with the Lord, or the soul goes to be in the place of judgment. So the question is, do we have a beginning? Yes. Do we have an end? No. And so we have immortal souls once it's created. There's a difference between eternal and immortal. Eternal would mean we don't have a beginning, that we've always been. God's eternal, we're not. But we're going into uh, life after we we're created. Number four, men and women were originally created good and true with communion with God. Uh, Adam and Eve had this opportunity to fellowship with God. They were created good and true. Uh, there was no sin in the world when Adam and Eve, when Adam was created and Eve was pulled from Adam, there was no sin in the world. They were good. They were true. They had communion and fellowship with God. They walked with God. They talked with God. Genesis chapter 3 tells us that God walked and talked with them, as was his custom in the cool of the day. Prior to sin, Adam and Eve had communion with God because they were good and true. Number five, men and women knew God's law. God had written the law on their heart. They knew it. That's what the confession teaches us. The confession says, besides this law written in their hearts. So God wrote in their hearts his law, his expectations. He imprinted upon them that which he expected of them as their creator. He also told them specifically, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So he imprinted the law, he, in, he wrote it on their hearts, but then he specifically said, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And as long as they kept that law, they had perfect and good communion with God, full communion with God, and they had dominion over the earth, and they were incredibly happy. There was no shame, there was no sorrow, there was no disappointment, there was no brokenness, there was no anxiety. None of that stuff existed. That, that just is a curse to us. None of that stuff existed. Because they had happiness as they, and fulfillment as they lived with God. They also possessed the power to fulfill God's law. Right? So they possessed the power. Uh, written on your heart, don't eat the tree. You have the power within you, good and true, to withstand the temptation. Yet they failed and they sinned. But they had the power to fulfill God's law. They also had the freedom in their own will. We still have freedom in our own will, right? They had freedom to make their own choice. 
They had the law written on their hearts. They had a specific command from God. They had a world that was created with them, created for them. They had a communion with God. You see, the, 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 everything was set up for their success. And yet, in the freedom of their will, they chose to reject God. They chose to pursue their own glory rather than the glory of God. We do the exact same thing. God didn't force obedience upon them. God gave them the opportunity, gave them what they needed, provided and created an an environment ready and ripe for their success, and yet they chose to fall away. They chose to eat of the tree. They had freedom of their will. God didn't impose himself upon them. He doesn't impose himself upon us. Men and women possessed at that time the possibility of transgressing the law, right? So they had freedom of their will, but they also possessed, as we said, the possibility of transgressing the law. It was up to them. They could withstand the temptation or they could transgress. Of course, we know the answer. They transgressed. Now, you may ask the question, if God has a decree, and God loves them, and God prepares this world for them, why did he create them with the freedom and the opportunity to transgress? Wouldn't it have been better for man to have never sinned? Yeah, that's a really good question. The only answer I have for it is uh, twofold. Number one, I think that um, it is in God's mind, uh, he, he wanted his creatures to respond willingly in their love. The greatest demonstration of love that you can give to someone is choosing to love them. You cannot impose love on someone. You can't make someone love you. You can't compel someone to love you. Right? The teenage boy trying to get the girl down the street understands that. He can do everything he can do to try to compel her to love him, but he can't make her love him. No one can make you love them. And so God can't compel love on them. You have to choose to love. And so um, he created them in his image with the choice to love because God himself is love and he chooses to love, right? And so he created them in his image for that purpose so that they would choose to love him. He gave them everything they had and yet they chose to love him. Well, then you may say, well, then God's decree was for them to fail and for them to fall. And the answer to that is yes, it was. Um, And you might say, why is that the case? We could go into long details about this. Let me just simply say this. Uh, You have to believe the testimony of the Bible is that it was better, right, for humanity, better for you and me, better for all of us, for them to have fallen from their original state of creation into sin and lived in brokenness, the curse of God coming upon men, women, and children for our sin so that Jesus then could come and redeem us and God could demonstrate his love for his people and saving them from their sins and restoring them into relationship with him through faith and repentance by his grace. Um, to one day take them to live with him eternally and execute judgment against those who've sinned for all eternity. All you could say is it was better in God's eyes, in God's mind, in God's plan for that to happen than for them to have never sinned. And we have to trust God's decree to be good, right, and true. So men and women possess the possibility of falling, and they fail, right? They fail. So, verse, uh, the, the ninth point is this. Men and women also, we could say, are created in God's image with knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness. We're told that God said, let us make man in our own image. What does that mean? Well, there's a lot of different debates about what it means to be created in the image of God, whether it's physical. Yes, I think the physical body is part, it, 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 the whole person. All of Adam and Eve, uh, all of Adam, let's just focus in on Adam because he was the first created being all of Adam, right, uh, human being, all of Adam is one person, just like all of you are one person. We don't separate body and spirit and soul and all those different things. We just say, when I speak of you and you speak of me, I'm speaking of the whole person, everything about you, right? And so there's a unified person. And so we have with Adam and then Eve, who came from Adam, and then us, of course, who came from them, we have a whole person. I think the whole person is created in the image of God. But I also think that there are some specific characteristics of our, um, our nature, of our being, that nothing else possesses. No other creatures possess. And the confession, working off the scriptures, 
pulls three of them. Knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness. Knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness. In the Bible, those three characteristics, knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness, will take on three different forms in the life of God's people in the Old Testament and then will be brought back together in the person of Jesus Christ. This will make much more sense as we dive into the redemption that is ours in Christ, our great Redeemer. But the first knowledge, the the opportunity and the ability to possess and communicate knowledge. Adam had the opportunity to possess and communicate knowledge and to learn and to grow. Do we have more, quote, head knowledge than Adam did? Probably yes, because we've lived for thousands of thousands of years, so millennia since he was first born. He saw clearly, since he was first created, he saw clearly where we see dimly, but we look longer, right? And throughout history, we've grown in our understanding and knowledge. But the opportunity to possess and communicate knowledge, that's a role that will become known in the history of God's people as a prophet. The opportunity to worship God in his holiness Right? Adam had the opportunity to, to live and, and Eve didn't commune with God and to worship God in his holiness. Um, that's an opportunity that will become known as a priestly role in the Old Testament into the person of Jesus. And king, the opportunity to subject all things to righteousness, including himself. Adam and Eve were to exercise God's dominion over all things, to subject it into the will of God. And and so they had the responsibility to rule as kings to subject it to righteousness. That again, as you know, will become a, a, a role that is fulfilled in the king of Israel that ultimately will come in Jesus, who is the prophet, the priest, and the king. That's the image of God. It was marred by sin. We still have the capacity to possess knowledge. We still have the capacity, the capacity to worship. We still have the capacity to be king and subject things to righteousness. It was marred by sin, changed by sin. But in our restoration through Jesus, we then possess the knowledge of God and grow in that understanding, possess the opportunity and through faith to come and worship God, and then also to rule in dominion and to exercise righteousness, not only of our own lives, of our family's life, of our church life, but also try to bring it about in our communities as well. That's what it means to live in the image of God and to extend the image of God. For that's restored in the person of Jesus. And there's a, a sense in which these three components to our being, as it were, are reflective of the three persons of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father being the knowledge, Son being the priest, Spirit and King being the one who governs and directs. I, I don't want to go too far into that because I don't want to shred closely to heresy, but, but I think there's a beauty to this that, that you'll understand more fully when we see the person of Jesus. So what does this mean for us? I've got to wrap this up. Four implications for the 21st century. Number one, you and I were specifically, wonderfully, and particularly made. You are not the result of a cosmic accident. Uh, the Bible's clear. You were specifically, wonderfully, and particularly made. Your first parents were. You are as well. Second of all, you and I have the purpose to, have a purpose to fulfill in our lives, right? So if we were specifically, wonderfully, and particularly made, God had it in mind. We are the crowning achievement of all of his creation. We're not like anything else. We have a specific purpose, and that specific purpose is to bring glory to God. If all things exist to be a manifestation of God's glory, then we have a responsibility to bring glory to God. We have a purpose in our lives. And if we are living to that purpose, we are fulfilled. If we are not living to that purpose, we are a basket case and chaos reigns in our lives. That's why people are so miserable, so aimless, because they're not living to the purpose for which they were created. You and I are created equal, right? Everybody was created in the same way, in the same image of God. We are created equal. There is an equality among men, women, and children. We are created equal. That's an important point. That doesn't, have, that doesn't mean that we don't have certain roles that we play. It doesn't mean that we don't have certain places that we live. It doesn't mean that we don't have certain interactions that we, we, we typically have with each other. It just means with reference to God and with reference to our being, with reference when you see another person, that person is an image bearer just like you are. And we're all created by God. And we all came from the same two parents, Adam and Eve. And lastly, you and I 
along with everyone else, came from the same parents and suffered the same effects of the fall. So every one of us not only is created equal, but every one of us suffers from the same effects of the fall. This is where Christians, I think, uh, really have something beautiful to say, and, 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 and Christian theology has something beautiful to say to our world around us. Um, we, we, we really don't right, judge each other based off of the color of our skin or, or those kinds of things. Because, right, as Christians, we know we are all created in the image of God. We are all equal. We all suffer the same effects of the fall. Now, have we always been successful in fulfilling that and, and, and living that out? No, not at all. I'll be the first to admit it. But just because we haven't always done it doesn't mean there's something wrong with the theology. The theology is solid and good and right and true and what the world actually needs and wants. Uh, a lot of the race stuff that we see, and I'm convinced of this, is, a, is contrived by our society in order to divide and to conquer and to set people against one another. As Christians, we, we've got to say, no, no, no. We are all created in the image of God. We all possess the capacity to grow knowledge and to grow in understanding, to worship God. And we all have the responsibility to to. to to subject the world to righteousness. We have that capacity, though it's marred, and the only way that's going to be restored fully is in Christ. And so we, we want to see each other come to Jesus. And so we are of the same parents. We deal with the same effects of the fall. Actually, that's a very unifying thing. <laughs> Creation, in the image of God, in my opinion, is a very unifying thing. Fall <laughs> is a very unifying thing. Uh, because we're all in the same predicament. We've all lost communion with God. Grace is a very unifying thing in Christ because everyone has the opportunity to be restored to God through faith in Jesus. And so our gospel is actually very unifying, and we ought to pursue it with all of our being. I'll end there this morning. Thank you guys so much. I hope this has been an encouragement to you as we get done. God bless you, and uh, I'll see you again next week. Take care. Again, show this video with whomever you wish. Take care. See you soon.